Welcome to the Investor Financing Podcast, where we interview real estate investors and lenders so you can learn all the secrets to getting your projects funded and scale your portfolio. Learn about fix and flip loans, burr financing, rental, fix to rent, commercial, multifamily bridge loans, business loans, and so much more. And now, your host, Bo Eckstein. Hey guys, what's up everybody? I, I know we're all been stuck at home and um, and uh, probably doing self-workouts and, and not being able to go to the gym, not being able to go to restaurants, but I'm taking this time to kind of like really kind of 10x everything I do. And, and um, you know, for years we've had our local real estate investor group and we'd have our meetups in Walnut Creek and San Ramon. Um, and then recently, five months ago, I moved to uh, Las Vegas and, um, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be online and, and a lot more. And then, you know, Ty and I have been buddies for a long time and have done deals together and it just kind of came together. We said, let's let's bring on like the best of the best people out there to motivate and educate like anybody who wants to plug in and, and get some really good, valuable content. And so um, Ty came up with the name Survive and Thrive, and I love it because it's true. It's like times of you know adversity, like right now, people are losing jobs and people are, are worried and people start getting negative. But you know, at the end of the day, really, it comes down to like your determination and drive. And and that's what I I was I went through the last downturn and it wasn't fun. I didn't know much about real estate investing. I owned the wrong type of assets. I wasn't cash flowing, and so. You know, this time around, I want to be in the position to take advantage of opportunities and to, you know, as as Ty and Pay say, squat up. And so if you guys want to plug in every Thursday night, we're going to bring people on that are going to really bring a lot of value. But without further ado, I'm going to bring Ty onto the, the stage here. And Ty, why don't you say hello to everybody? Hey, everybody. Glad you guys are here. We got a powerhouse in the house tonight. We got Thatch to win. And I'll just share you guys, I've known Thatch now for almost three decades. And um, I would say this is definitely, you know, they people talk about day ones. Thatch is one of my true, true day ones. And that Thatch and I met at Mike Ferry event. I'd say it was like 1995, 96, somewhere in there, mid 90s. The economy was flat at the time. Um, we were two young hustlers. The interesting thing, and Thatch is going to share his story, but um, Thatch and I immediately resonated uh, became really fast friends. And it was such a good environment because back then we were all hustling and grinding to make commissions and all of that. And then, you know, Thatch, you know, has continued to stretch himself and out there as an investor and even a developer doing lots of development. And I'm going to have Thatch share his story, but I can tell you that um, also too, if you see behind me here, I think on this side here, you'll see, I don't know if you guys can see my Buddha there, the the artwork, but I'll say that Thatch was also one of my brothers where he is all about contribution. And, you know, Thatch was probably one of the earliest people when we were in our mid twenties who really was fully engaged in, in the conversation about consciousness and about elevating our energy and attraction and vibration. And those were all foreign to me. I hadn't heard anything like that. And Thatch was definitely a leader in that movement within our masterminds, within our circle of influence. And, you know, of course, you guys see what you see Thatch now, and he lives an amazing lifestyle. He's got a beautiful family. Um, I would describe Thatch as one of the ultra most successful real estate entrepreneurs as a developer, as, a de as, as an investor, but even more so as a human who goes out to make a difference for others. And if, as you get to know Thatch, if you don't already know him, he's all about contribution. He's all about sharing. He's all about uplifting. And so Thatch, thank you for being with us. Let's get this on the road, baby. Let's do this. Let's go, baby. Let's go. So, so share. I know about half the people that are on here, they know you, they know your story. There's the other half, though. There's a newer audience, people that aren't familiar. They know the modern day. They see you, the cars, and you know, developing and doing projects and knocking doors. And we'll talk about that. We'll get to that in a minute. But I want them to share with a lot of our listeners kind of the early days when you and your family came to America and your dad and the struggles and just share, share your, your early years with us. Yep. Yep. So I was born in Vietnam in 1970. In 1975, I was about five years old. My dad, <clears throat> he worked for the U S military in Vietnam and he got a phone call one day from his bosses. Hey, 
Um, the communists are going to invade South Vietnam in 24 hours. Uh, we're going to pull the troops, the U.S. troops, out of Vietnam, and we're going to leave. You should go home, get your family, and you should leave with us. Otherwise, you're probably going to be killed, and your family's going to be probably captured. So you should come with us because you work with the U.S. So my dad called home one afternoon uh, during lunchtime, and he told my mom, hey, I'm coming home. Pack what we got, and I'm going to pick you guys up. We're leaving to America. And my mom was like, really? And um, he came home, and um, I have four brothers and a, uh, four brothers and a sister. My mom was pregnant. My sister at the time, and uh, we, my mom packed all of the clothes in one suitcase. We had a hundred bucks uh, in our pocket, and then we left to the airport. And on the way to the airport, you guys, my dad blew two tire on his jeep. So by the time we got to the airport, we already missed the last plane. We get to the airport, and he trying to frantically call his boss. And after hours and hours, he finally got rid of his, he got his boss. And his boss said, well, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get one more plane to leave. So make sure you meet us at this gas station. And then we're going to put everybody in this U-Haul truck. And then we're going to bring you guys into the airport because nobody knows that the city is evacuating. And so my dad got a hotel in Saigon. All of us is up there uh, eating and sleeping. My dad stepped in the Jeep because he didn't want nobody to steal it. And uh, we got up in the morning and we went to the uh, to the uh, gas station. We hopped into this U-Haul truck and we headed into the airport. When we got to the airport, they opened up the the, uh, the, the door, man. Everybody's running everywhere. And, um, you know, we got on the last plane uh, and we flew out of the last plane and we landed in uh, California and they used Camp Pennington at the, at the time for the homeless shelter. And we stayed there for a few months. And then my dad got shipped up to Washington State. We lived in a, uh, a shelter up there for about a two months or so. Met this gentleman named Charles Zettler, who actually sponsored our family to come live with him. And we lived with him for about two years. And in 1977, almost 78, my dad got a job at a uh, the welfare office as a social worker. And he, he knew how to speak English back then. And he was a social worker, but his but where he worked and where we lived was 45 minutes. So the mom, Charles' mom, she was like 67 years old. She would drive my dad to work. You got 45 minutes into work. She would come back home and she'd drive back into Seattle, into Seattle 45 minutes later. <coughs> I mean, late at night and pick him up. And she did that for about two years. And then finally, about um, uh, two years later, we moved. We got a little two bed and one bath house up in Rainier Valley. And we started our life there, man, Rainier Valley. And uh, I went to school there, have paper routes all around the neighborhood. And um, um, uh, when I basically was my freshman year, I was doing good in high school, my sophomore year, junior year. And then my senior year, I started hanging around with a bunch of friends where they wanted to go out and go to the club, go to the party and drink. And I got hooked up with that crowd. And then by the time I graduated from high school, I got a 2.8 GPA. And a lot of the teacher like, man, you know, that, you know, you're gonna have a hard time, man, going anywhere with that. And today I'm gonna tell you real quick, it's not the grade point average you got would dictate your success. It's how hungry you are that would dictate your success. Let me tell you, okay? And so I graduated. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And uh, I went to college with my older brother to fix aviation airplane in, uh, in, um, in uh, um, when I graduated um, in uh, 1989, I graduated in uh, 1988, I went to college for 89, 90, 91. They got my aviation uh, airplane degree. I hated it. I'm gonna give you another tip. Only do a thing that you're really inspired about. Don't do a thing because your mom and dad want you to do it, okay? Um, I graduated in 91. I wasn't sure what I want to do. I was parking car at a Chinese restaurant. I was the dairy manager at Safeway and I worked at a body shop in 91. And one of my friends said, you should do real estate. You got a good mouthpiece. And I was inspired by it all of a sudden for some reason. And I went and got my test and I passed. I was 21 years old when I got my real estate test, you guys. And I made it. And I was the youngest I ever hired in uh, real estate in Washington. But the problem is I didn't have a coach that really taught me what to do as a real estate agent. So from 1991 to 1994, I sat around the office <coughs> waiting for someone to call me. And wouldn't nobody call me. And I, I had two or three deals a year from my dad's friend. That was about it. <clears throat> in 1994, man, when everything changed for me, is when I met Mike Ferry. And, Beautiful. Uh, and that's when my journey started with Mike Ferry in 1994. That's when I met Ty and Joe D and everybody there. 
I love it. I love it. What a blessing you've been. So, so tell everybody kind of um, like some of the, the, the true gangster 1994, like, you know, Mike, Mike Ferry was the original gangster of, you yep. know, of training and hardcore sales for, for in our life. And so just share kind of like how Thatch, how young Thatch meets Mike Ferry gets involved with the coaching training. What does your schedule look like? How was your business? Yep. How did you grow and propel? How did you move forward? So when I met Mike Ferry uh, at a action workshop, he said three things that I thought it was profound. Um, he said the three ways you can find business. And this even worked even for the wholesaler today listening, okay? You can sit around, wait for something to come, and it's going to be very hard to duplicate it and uh, repeat it. You can spend a lot of money on ads, but it's also very hard to duplicate and repeat it, and it costs you a lot of money, or you can go out there and uh, prospect and find it yourself, and it costs you nothing. And I was like, well, I got no money. I'm young. I'm willing to do it. And he says, and he had a $300 program. He says, know these scripts, which I believe everyone should know. Know these scripts, and I want you to go talk to a lot of people. And and I was like, okay, I can do that. And I met this guy named Floyd Canelari at the workshop, and I went and spent time with Floyd, and he was out there doing like a hundred doors. And when I was down there, I was like, okay, well, this don't look too damn hard, right? And so uh, I created a schedule. I, went, I said, I'm going to go home. I have no business. And I'm going to door knock from nine o'clock in the morning. And I want to door knock a hundred doors like Floyd. And it took me five hours to door knock a hundred doors. And I committed to myself. I'm going to door knock five hours a day, Monday through Friday, which is five days a week. And I'm going to do it basically until, you know what I mean? I just stopped. And that was my new commitment. I knew my script. I didn't have no business. In 1994, I met Mike Ferry. I knew my script. And then I just basically, you guys, parked the car. And I made a 100 flyer in my hand. And my commitment was to knock on a 100 door and pass out the flyer. And um, I knocked out from 9 o'clock. I got dead at 1 o'clock. And I just did that Monday through Friday every day. Uh, and I did it, you guys, for uh, 10 years straight, nonstop. Every day, five days a week. The rain, the sun, you name it. I did it for 10 years straight. And uh, my first year, you know what I mean? Uh, I did about probably eight, nine deal, but I got rejected massively because my skill set was low and my mindset was low at the same time. And I got my skill better. I got my mindset better. And I did it every day again next year. And I did it every day you got for 10 years. And then I went up to 10 deal, 20 deal, 30 deal, 40 deal, 50 deal, 120, 130, 150 deals a year. And that's how I made all my money is from door knocking and cold calling. And today we're going to talk more about that. But today... About a year ago, I started door knocking again, four hours a day, four days a week now. Strong. Strong. I love it. I love it. So even just a little bit of the backlog, dude, I love it. It's so good to just have you here and be authentic and share, you know, how you get, how you got here. And so share with everybody, like, I mean, I know the backstory, but like when you started like the investing side, when did you, I know like Saul has been a big mentor of yours, maybe elaborate on that. Yep. And then maybe when did you kind of make that shift? And then how did you progressively grow as a, as an investor? Yeah. And this is a big turn point, you guys. And thank God I have my wife cause she's very grounded because um, I, when I started in 1991, uh, I worked for a company called Windermere Real Estate. And then in 1995, four years later, Saul recruited me to come to his office. And he said, if you come to my office, I will teach you how to actually invest in real estate and have your money work for you when you're asleep, like the tree outside. And if you come here, you just keep doing your thing. And if you don't mind sharing what you do once a month for all the agent in my office. And then in return, I teach you how to invest and have your money work for you and grow when you're sleeping at night like the tree. And I, it was so foreign to me. I was like, really? Okay. And my wife, Cammie, was so into it, right? But here was the dilemma, Ty. I never told you this. The dilemma was I had a choice. It's Saul, am I going to spend time learning about investing? Or am I going to go coach for Mike Ferry? Hmm. And I was so wanted to be, co uh, be a coach for Mike Ferry because, you know, Ty, you know, Tom, you know, he's telling us, you know, and, you know, all my friends, like, you, everybody was coaching. But then Saul was like, listen, man, you can go coach. That's great. But you're young, learn to invest, park your money early so you can really appreciate it later. And thank God my wife was like, honey, let's focus on investing. If you want to coach me, coach people around you. 
but you don't need to be tying yourself up to all these clients. And that was my tipping point was I made a commitment. Okay. I will coach people around the office, but I'm going to really focus on learning how to buy investment property. And so Saul started teaching me. And the key for me, what he said to me was, and everybody know this, but I think people need to be reminded selling real estate is just building richness. You trade your money for time. Wealth is basically you're trading your money back for time. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Are you looking for funding? Are you getting frustrated trying to find a lender? Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and click the Get Funding button. Complete the simple form and schedule a free phone consultation with one of our placement specialists. We have a proprietary directory of funding partners that can help you get the funding you need. It's fast and easy to explore the options available for your specific needs. Don't wait. Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and get connected. Connected. So rich is trading your uh, your time for money, wealthy trading your time your money back for time. And Saul said to me, if you really really wanted to actually have a a, a life, uh, if you choose to work or not to work when you get to your fifty, I'm forty nine, I'm gonna be fifty here uh, this year. When you get to fifty, that you're gonna have the blessing, my brother, to work whenever you want to work, where you want to work, and you really built the cash flow game up. And he says, I want you to really think about. Just sell real estate to make your money. But then when you have money, I want you to pull it off the table. I want you to buy rental property. I want you to make a commitment to buy the rentals. Every time you have enough money, buy it. If you don't buy it, you're going to spend your money on some bullshit. And thank God Cammy was my, you know, my partner. Yep. And I bought my, I got with Saul in 1995 when I had that conversation. And then my first rental property was 1997. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So, I know a lot of the people know because they've been to your events, they've come to springboard events, but then I know there's a new audience. If you don't mind sharing, like yeah. I know, share with people, what, what's your passive income? <laughs> so I bought my first property, you guys, uh, in 1997, my first house. And today I own single family houses still. I still buy single family home. I built townhouses and I rent them out. And I built a big apartment building. I'm doing a big apartment building right now in downtown Oakland right now, I have 100 unit. Uh, I built a big apartment building, bigger 250 units. Some of them I sold in the past. Uh, but right now, uh, I have over 100 some property. And right now, in passive income, after everybody's pay, I have about over $100,000 a month coming out every single month. Nice. Yeah. Great job, dude. Great and, job. And let me say this, Ty. And I'm, I'm going to tell you guys this. One, I made all my money from selling real estate and parking it in residence, I mean, in the investment property. And pretty much, Eight out of 10 of all my, 90% of all my property, guys, I don't have no investor. I own all my property with me and my wife, Cammie. I don't work with investor. I don't mess with investor. The only time I ever bring an investor in when I do a big 100, 200, 300 unit apartment building. But the rest of the stuff I do myself. And there's a lot of reason why less headache, but you need to keep all the money yourself. So if you can go out there and generate cash flow through the front door, you can actually own real estate yourself. The only reason why people, in my opinion, don't uh, 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 they they um, they don't want to go bring their own money? Yeah. It's because they want to move real fast and go raise capital. But the problem is, somebody put all the capital in the in the world of investment property, you'd be lucky to get twenty percent or twenty five percent of the whole pot. And someone could say, well, well, that's better than nothing. But you're doing all the work with twenty five percent. Right, right, right. That ain't nothing. Totally. You really think it from that angle. Right. So you have enough money, do it yourself and keep one hundred percent of the money. And the thing is, people don't realize you don't even need that much passive income to really live a good life. Everybody out there want to raise capital. Oh, I want to do a hundred unit building. I want to do hundred unit building. Fool, if you had ten rental properties, free and clear, you live a hell of a good life. Because most rental properties, you get three grand a month. You got ten of those bad boys, free and clear. That's thirty grand a month for the rest of your life. And if everything is free and clear, you live like a king. I love it. I love it. I love it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back to Bo. Bo, and I know Bo's been monitoring the questions. Thank you, Thatch. I appreciate everything you're sharing. I know that amazing, right? So let's just Bo, why don't you questions? Yeah, well, I, I got a question because yep. um so so both of you guys are big, big pros, pro, uh, prospectors. Like you guys 
have that skill set. And so I came from like, that's where I lack me personally. It's like, I, I've been really good at like kind of big picture getting uh, thrown out nets and getting people to come in. But I know I could 10 X my business, but, but like what I hear from both of you um, and I just met Thatch, but you guys put in the work, you guys do what people don't want to do. You guys door knock, you guys cold call, you guys get your hands dirty. And that's why you guys are doing some serious numbers. Right. I mean, that's the, that's the real key. And, and can you go to t- talk to me about like, because you're, you're both big fans of Mike Ferry, just like kind of what the, what he instilled in you guys early on that that now you guys have taken and, and blown up your businesses with. Go ahead, Ty. Thatch. Okay. So, you know, I think just, you know, it's interesting that when Thatch and I hooked up, the beauty, I think the one of the things that probably the best thing that came out of Mike Ferry is what we're all doing now, which is squatting up. The idea is that you have these peer groups and the idea is that peer groups of people that are like-minded, that are hungry. I, that's the number one thing is that, you know, like Thatch, Joe D, Alex Lear, uh, Jeff Quinton, um, you know, we could go on and on and on. But there's these groups and we've always had these networks where the guys are hungry. The guys all share. We all lift each other up. Um, we're all competitive and push each other to do more. Um, We all inspire each other. And um, I think just that's the number one thing for myself. Thatch, can you kind of share about a little bit of peer group and your thoughts there? I I would say, man, the biggest thing I took away from uh, the Mike Ferry mindset is this. Either you can sit around waiting for business to come to you or you're going to go out there and hunt it yourself. Really, wholesaler, right? If you really want to make good money, wholesaler, you go prospect directly to the owner who has the property and then you wholesale that deal. But yep. don't be wholesaling daisy chain shit, man. That shit ain't no money in that fucking shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> go find the owner directly and prospect them and ask them they want to sell and then tie the property up, then wholesale that. That's where you make a lot of money. Do okay? the work. Do Absolutely. The work. Do the work. Okay. okay, Omar is asking, can you explain to us how important it is to make sure your skills are on point for retail real estate? He's an agent, especially yeah. if you get to the next level as a listing agent, 50 to 100 plus deals, especially using the commission checks for, for buying the investment property. So I think he's looking for, how do I, he's a successful agent. I don't know his volume right now, but he's like, how do I, how do I get to the next level? And then, then how do I, how do I put my investor uh, mind, uh, mindset on, you know, cause if you're prospecting these deals, I mean, some of them are really sweet. You're going to take them down yourself. Can you kind of walk us through the mindset of like converting from a decent agent to a high level agent and then yep. into an investor. Good. I'm going to tell you, Omar, I know, I know Omar, I know which Omar this is. I'm going to tell Omar this from, from life experience, Omar. You do not want to stop taking the gas pedal off your resident business. I know you're, you got 35 listing this year already. Good for you, bro. You do not want to stop. The problem with most agents, they go, oh, well, I can flip a house and make a hundred grand. But yeah, it took you four months, motherfucker. What are you talking about? So it didn't make one month. It took you four months to make it. But if you're really killing the real estate game, you can make a hundred grand a month, not four months. That's what nobody want to talk about. You know what I mean? So Omar, and this is what I'm doing, Omar, also, okay? For me, Omar, like, let me show you something. Today, I don't really spend a lot of time focusing on my residential business. However, I still call my database. I still work them. I used to get about a hundred plus referral to just list property. I probably get about 50 or 60 of them a year, Omar, from just basically touching base on them and just work the referral business. But I don't call expire. I don't call for example. I don't call Disney to sell no more. What I do do after I talk to five or six of my database a day, Omar, this is an example, you guys. These are lists that I created in Seattle that I know these are fixer upper in a certain zip code. So let's say I choose 98144 zip code, right? That's one of the zip code you. Out of that whole area, there might be maybe 3,000 homes. But out of that 3,000 homes, there might be about 150 fixer. I have identified as fixer and I created this list. So a lot of guys talk about drive for a dollar. My friend Matthew down in Portland talking about drive for a dollar. That's just driving, driving, driving. What I teach people how to do is find the fixer first and then drive it. Cause now you drive it specifically what I call low hanging fruit. This is like driving to see all the foreseeable owner basically. So Omar, for me, when I go out there and I have this list, I drive out there and I door knock on the door. 
If I walk up to this door, Omar, and the house looks like it's really, really beat up, I, I use this script. Hi, my name is Thatch. I'm a real estate investor. I'm also a broker. I noticed you own this house, and I wanted to ask you if you don't mind, have you had any thoughts on when you might consider selling it? I'd love to buy it from you. Okay? Now, if I get to the house and the house looks like it's relatively decent, it could lean more towards a listing, then the script sounds like this. Hi, my name is Thatch. I work for John L. Scott Real Estate. I you know, I know you own this property. Right now, inventory is very low in my neighborhood, in this neighborhood. I wanted to ask you, have you had any thoughts on when you might consider selling this property? So at the end of the day, now here's the difference between back in the day, Omar, and back in the day today, Thatch. Back in the day, I will prospect with the mindset of taking a listing. I get a good house, yes, I'm excited to get a listing. I get a fixer, it's a listing. I get a piece of land, it's a listing. It's always a listing. Today, when I prospect, when I prospect, my mindset is I want to buy the property. So I'm going after property that I can buy. So I go after a property. Can I buy this property and can I fix it and, and uh, rehab it and then keep it as a burr? If it don't fit as a burr, can I flip it and make money? If it doesn't fix it, if it doesn't fit a flip, can I assign it and make some money? If it's not enough margin assignment, I will just list it as a consolation price. So if the mindset before was as an agent, it's always a list. The mindset today is burr, flip, assign, and listing. So at the end of the day, Omar, I'm still listing property, but I'm going as after I call my database, I'm going after calling and door knocking, fixer up prop fixer property. So I can do one of those four. That's the different mindset today. I love it. I think, you know, I think there's like, if you're a real estate agent out there and you're not an investor, I mean, there's no better position to be than a, than a, a, a real estate agent Hell and yeah. an investor. I mean, if you're, yeah. if you're selling real estate, you don't have a retirement account unless you buy real estate. Right. right. So it's like, it's like the number one thing. And I, and I talked to so many real estate agents. Um, I'm also a broker in California. Um, and it's like, they don't, they don't, they don't understand anything about the investment side. And, and it's like, they're missing. I mean, they can't work with investor clients cause they don't know how to figure out what the ARV is. They don't understand Burr. I mean, these are things that if, if you're an agent, you learn these basic skills and you're going to sell, you know, 10 times more properties because you can deal with, and these investors, if you bring them deals, they're going to buy five or six properties a year from you. Okay. I mean, just, just ask Ty. That's what he does. He sells the same, it's to the same buyers. You know, he has a buyer's list, of, a huge buyer's list, but there's probably only 10 that buy multiple deals because they're easy to work with. And it's now, easy for him to. If you're an agent on this phone, and after this conference call, if you guys don't go out there and start making money and start buying rental property, you deserve to be broke 10 years from now. If you're in the business where you are the first man on the front line, if the property's good, you need to buy that shit, man. What you in this business for? Listen, you're not in the business to sell real estate. What I realized after doing this for 30 years, you guys, selling real estate is a vehicle to make money, to pay for my lifestyle in the now, but to take the money to invest it for wealth for tomorrow. That's what selling real estate for, not to be number one. Fuck number one. Number one, don't pay the bill when you broke like this. When the economy is like this, pay selling real estate, don't do it. Passive income does it right now. This is why I hope everybody learned from this crash. Passive income will make you uh, go through this good. But if you don't have passive income, you're going to die by the vine. So let's, let me ask you another question. You're, you're in Washington and your, your median price point is pretty expensive. I'm, I'm, I'm taking it. So how do you, what's your, what's your structure to get the cash flow? How do you, on a single family home, I mean, I know you're making money, so it's easier now for you to put down 25%. But if you're just starting out and you might only have uh, one, two, three doors right now, I mean, what's your advice? I mean, obviously we're going it, we might get a little decline in prices, but how are you going to cash flow in these more expensive markets? What's your strategy behind that? Today? One of my biggest secrets I teach a lot of people, I'm going to share with you guys right now, okay? Let's just say... Well, well, zoom in so Thatch is really big, if that's possible, if you can kind of make him the, the main, just so we can see his background. You're going, to, you're going to get on the whiteboard there? I'm going, to, I'm going to share with you right here. I'm trying to figure out how to make... Okay, hold on. There's like... There we go. Look. Hold on. If you guys... There we go. Sell real estate. If you guys are selling real estate, and you guys are prospecting, you find opportunity... Okay, 
Your job, you guys, is to pick it up. So Bowman, answer your question right now. Seattle right now, our average price right now is about $800,000, okay? And here's what I want to tell you guys. If you're an agent, go make money like Omar and then use that money as your seed money. So what I do, you guys, is when I make my list, I go make lists that I'll fix her up for a bow, okay? Here's a property I recently bought, okay? This is a, I bought it for 285000 in Seattle. Now, the first thing everybody will say is, what the hell, Two eighty five? you can buy a house for that? Let me give you the secret on this, okay? Here's the secret. I bought this for two eighty five, and it cost me $140,000 to rehab it, okay? I'm all in, you guys, at $425,000, all in. Harmony Lender says, and Bo, you tell me if I'm right, if you take 425, Harmony Lender says, put down 20% and I finance the rest for you. So 20% of 425 is $85,000. I only have to come out of this deal, 85,000, okay? So when I get done with this property, I wanted to keep it as a rental property. The bank sent out a 30 year fixed bank, sent out an appraiser and they appraised this house for $700,000. Someone's gonna say, what, 700? How the hell did you get that? And you only bought for 285. Now, Bo, I need your help on this, bro. $700,000, the bank appraised for that, okay? The bank says, I will lend you up to 70% LTV. So 70% of 700,000 is 490,000, you guys. You with me? Yep. They said, I will lend you up to 490 grand if you want it. And I tell the bank, I don't want 490. I just want 425. Let me finance 425 and I'm good. Now, if I finance 425, that means I can get my 20% back, which is my 85,000. And then the other 80 can go back to hard money. So I literally finance 425, 100%. And that means I got my 85,000 back in my pocket. And then now I got a property. I got no money in it, Bo, of my own true money. I got $275,000 uh, equity. And that property, I have a loan on for four twenty-five, dollars and the mortgage on that right there is about $2,700. I rent the house out for $3,500. So I make about five, six hundred bucks every month with no my cash with $275,000 equity. So, Bo, here's the million dollar question everybody asks me How do you get a property to purchase $700? You're going to pay two eighty-five, dollars And this is the secret where you got to know how to find real estate. And this is what most real estate you don't know how to do. This house was a two bedroom, one bath with an unfinished basement that you gotta go outside to get to the basement. It puts <laughs> only five feet high. When I bought this property, I got the whole entire uh, upstairs and tied. You know what's even better than that? Instead of raising the house, you guys, I jacked out the floor and I dropped the floor about almost two feet. So I can nice. use height ceiling. So then when I got done with this house, it came, Two bed and one bath upstairs, two bed and one bath downstairs. Now I got an 1,800 square foot house that's worth eight, that's 700,000. So when I bought it, I bought it as a two bed and one bath, 900 square feet house fixer. So when I show you guys lists like this, these are property I identify in my area where I can actually buy the fixer and have potential to either drop the basement, finish the attic, Remodel the garage in the backyard into a dadu. That's how you create high ARV and buy a property. Two is 85. I didn't steal it from the owner. That was what it's worth. It's probably worth like 300, 310. But I said, I door knocked them. I got a better deal. But the real value was I dropped the basement on this house and add two more bedrooms and a bath. And that's how I jumped the ARV. And I knew it because I know the area, what four bedroom houses sell for in the area. So when I created a little fixture, Omar, are you listening? I go door knock this. If I can't get a good deal on this, I will either fix and flip it or I will assign it. But all my deal, you got that a burr property, it has to have over 30% margin to be able to get all your 85,000 out. Otherwise it won't work. You got to flip it then. Love that, it. Love yeah, it. yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's the real thing too. And over the years of doing real estate, uh, being an investor, being an agent, you're going to learn how to do these value add plays, right? Where, where you're looking at it and the other investor is going to say, well, it's a two bedroom, one bath and a half mile radius. It's only worth 500,000. But once you get the experience, you can say, okay, but it's not really that hard. We're going to 
jackhammer down. We're going to create eight foot ceilings and we're going to add a thousand square foot at a, at a thousand bucks a square foot. We just add huge amount of value. So like even in a competitive market, if you have these skill sets and that's like adding bedrooms, adding bathrooms and, right. and, and you don't, you don't have to do the, the big, it doesn't have to be a big value play too. You could no. be doing this all within the envelope of the property. I mean, yeah. I see this. And you want to do that to keep the cost down. Yeah. Yep. Now I'm going to say this real quick. It will say this fresh in my mind. Look at this, Bo. Out of my pocket when I did this deal, you got to have 85000 So sell real estate. Get your 85000 folks. All right? If that's the same down payment. But this deal took me about four months to rehab it. it. You need to hold it for six months in order for you to rehab it. I mean, to refinance it. Okay? So if this takes, this call it six months. If you have 85000 that means in one year, you can actually do two burr as a rental property with the same 85000 in five years, you can have 10 rental property with the same 85,000 you started from day one. That's how you come up, folks. That's how you come up. The goal with selling real estate now is to make money to live, have a good life, get yourself 85,000. If you really kill them, like Omar, get 200,000 and do four of those property a year, yeah. right? Four times five, you can have 20 of those in 10 years, okay? In five years. But you sell real estate so you can get the $85,000 and to go out there and be in the front line and find the property you to buy for yourself. And if it doesn't fit what you like, list the property so you make your commission. Okay, so love it. do you have a question? Great job, dude. Love it. Love it. Recycling the down payment. Recycling it, baby. Love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. Keep going, Bo. Keep going. Let's let's keep firing questions. So 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 here's another question. Um, people are, have uncertainty 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 with the market right now, right? Like um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna hit a recession or we're in a recession. We're gonna see we're gonna see prices drop. We're gonna see motivated people sellers. So I mean, what's your your mindset in an opportunity is almost it's unfortunate what's going on, but really for business, I mean as a real estate investor, your mindset is shifting now and you're looking that you're looking down the road six to 12 months thinking there's going to be a tremendous amount of motivated people that you need to help get out of their properties. So kind of talk me through like what's in your, on your mind right now, like going forward, like to create, you know, to help others and also create wealth. So coming out of the 2008 market crash, I don't think I ever told Ty this, you know, I had a 250 unit apartment building. I had multiple rental properties, multiple commercial property, uh, and I had houses everywhere around Seattle. And you know what I realized, you guys, in 2008? The property that are closer toward the epicenter didn't lose much in value. The property farther away from the epicenter of Seattle, it, well, I had all my equity was flushed out of it. And so what I realized now, after doing this now, and coming out of the 2008 market, I started selling a lot of my property that was farther away from Seattle and at 1031, I'm closer into the epicenter of Seattle where I live. Okay. So if you have a mindset of doing real estate for long term, then like right now, I, I, I got cash sitting around and I'm looking only in the epicenter. I don't mess with anywhere outside the outside far away from the epicenter anymore because, because inside the epicenter in my area where I work every eight to 10 years, it double in value. Every eight to 10 years, it double, it double. In the era I used to do it, when I was back then, where you can buy it for cheap, it's been 20 years since I owned some of these property, and it went up once, double once, all right? The rent still stayed the same back then, okay, till today. So today, in the area I work, I'm keeping my eye open. And if those property in my area dip down, and if it can meet minimum, instead of 30 now, it's gonna be 50% minimum in margin. So I'm raising my standard bow and tie in my area where I'm doing 30% margin right now to do burr. I'm looking for deals that are 50%. I mean, I'm still going to have to fix her, but it got to be at least 50% margin when I get done with it. Okay. And I don't mind buying it because in the epicenter, it doesn't go down so far because people in the epicenter have money, yeah. but there's still a lot of fixer. And those are the people who own fixer that they are ready to sell those damn thing. Now, listen, I can show you guys, stacks and stacks of lists in front of my desk. Those are hundreds and hundreds of fixtures just in the epicenter, okay? So for me, Bo, I'm just gonna tell you guys from experience, 
if you're ever going to invest and hold per property, get closer into the area where there's a lot of density because it doesn't drop much in value and the rent is always strong. Right now, I'm going to give you real time what's happening right now. I own a lot of property in the, uh, de uh, the uh, epicenter. And right now, in the month of April, I got renter that's supposed to pay me from April 1st to April 15th. Those are all the rents coming in. Right now, out of all my property, 99% of them are paying their rent this month, even though they all lost their job. The yep. area is farther away. They're the first person that said, yo, that I can't pay this month. And that's what I learned in 2008 market. Now, are you flipping? Flip, buy them anywhere. But if you're going to be outside farther away, you better make sure you raise your standard and get bigger margin because if it still go down, you got big margin to compensate for it. That's my, my experience for today. I love it. I love it. That's some, some really good advice. So, raise your uh, standards, folks, the key. Raise your standards, the key. Yeah, love it. Love it. So that's I'm, I'm going to both teeing up some more um, questions, but I wanted to ask you is just share, you know, like how you show up is very passionate, yep. powerful, strong. Share like just some of the routines you have for consciousness, your morning routine and kind of how does how does that prep his day and prime himself? I know the answer, but I want you to share with the audience because I think there's some things you do that maybe um, that could help a lot of the listeners. And I think maybe share that, that, that it'll uplift people. Yeah. So the so one thing I do every morning, I wake up and I, I wake up early and I work out. That's important. The second thing that I do that's super important. And I think a lot of people don't realize this. Number one, make sure you guys are doing things for the right reason. Don't go self how don't go flip houses. You see everybody flipping houses. Don't go out there and want to be an investor. Everybody doing it. Right, one of my friends, I just actually just talked with her today. She was a real estate person. She loved real estate, but you know what she really loved more? To be a chef. And so she dropped real estate. She wanted to be a chef, which is okay. So do the right thing. Then the next thing, you guys, is you gotta spend time quieting the mind. Every morning, you guys, I spend 15, 20 minutes and I always sit in the silence and I just listen to see the message that coming to me. Like this morning, I asked my dad. You know, I meditate, my dad passed away. And I asked my dad, I said, during my, my meditation, dad, right now there's a lot of people right now that are losing their job. Do me a favor, dad, right? We got a lot of rental property and help me out and help me make sure that all the people is going to pay it this month because we can't afford to have 20, 30, 40, 50 people not pay because we'd be paying their mortgage. We're going to be in trouble, right? And so I turn it over and ask my dad and God, the universe, whatever you got to believe, to help orchestrate a lot of things I can't control. And that's one thing I can't control. One of the things I also asked my dad is, is to help flatten the curve in Washington State faster than the other area. And Washington State right now is the curve is starting to go in a flat, more flatter way. So these are things that I spend time every day asking. And, you know, like every day I, when I'm calling, I I'll ask my dad, dad, you know, I'll line up the right people for me so I can do business with that easy flowing. There's no resistance. They're happy. I'm happy. Line those people up when I'm prospecting every day. I don't need nobody's heart. Hardcore asshole. I don't want them anyway. But when I'm profiting that, just set me up with the right people at the right time, the right place every single time. And that's how I find all my business. Every prop I buy are all with the right people every single time. I just bought a prop the other day, you guys, on the lady I co call. I don't think I've ever told you this, I. I got her number. I went by her property. She wasn't home. I left the flyer there. I called her the next day. I called her on the phone. I said, hey, you own this property across you from my house. I, I, I'm rehabbing. You want to sell it? She said, no. Then I say, great. Well, I know she owns this other property not too far away from it. Would you sell that? She said, no, I'm not selling. So I was going to get off the phone with you guys and ask her one last question. I said, do you have any other property you might consider selling? Because I want to buy, you know, property that either fix up or build townhouses. She said, well, it's funny you ask. I got a site over here in this area, uh, up in this area. You can go check it out. If you like it, I sell that property. I'm like, all right. She gave me the address. And I'm like, ooh, this is a good address. I went by and took a look at it. And I said, I called her back. I said, hey. I like it, right? And I said, um, she, she said, she said, I said to her, how much you want for? It? She said, I want seven fifty. I said, well, I'll give you seven hundred. You cool with that? She said, I like it. That so give me seven ten. We call it good. So I said, all right, seven ten done. She said, well, since you're at it, the two houses next to it, I own those two. If you want to buy all, all both of those, and I sell for seven ten, oh both. So I bought all three of them together, and when I add them all three together, I can build eighteen to twenty townhouse on it. So I bought it for seven hundred ten times three. 
And I just signed the contract on it two days ago from co-calling the lady. Nice. Really were just easy going for me. You see what I mean? Nice. Easy uh, flow, yeah. right? Easy flow, just baby. Flow. I love it. All right, next question. Uh, Ernesto asks, for a brand new agent, how do you track and systemize cold calling and door knocking? How do you decide who to call and knock? Ty, what would you say as an agent first? Um, I think, you know, I think I love what Thatch is talking about. So I think specifically with, you know, for what I do, I do a lot of absentee owners. Yep. We work a notice of defaults. Um, we also work probate lists. Um, I do love what Thatch does too, which I think doing more of is getting out in the doors and then specifically tracking and looking for high probability fixer uppers. Yeah. So that that that's who I work. That share yeah. more about what you do and how you yeah. line up your for a new agent. If I was called your new agent, number one, you gotta you gotta work your sphere. Though that is the lowest hanging fruit you can work. Get a list of all the sphere you know, touch base to them. And if you got nothing else to do, then you got to cold call or door knock to find business. That's why I love Mike Ferry. You can't just sit around the office, right? But what Mike taught us before was machine gun style. Just cold call everybody in the neighborhood, right? What I'm saying is if I was coaching a new agent, I would teach you cold call fixer. And the reason why if you cold call fixer, those are owners that use their house that are really tired. They don't know where to start to sell their home. Yep. They, won't, they don't want to list it. The house is beat up. So I would have you pull up all the fixer in the area. And then instead of cold call them just randomly, you cold call those lists. But then before you cold call, I want you to drive by those property first and door knock them. And when you drive by, if it looks like a fixer, you're going to knock on it, right? And you use the script. You know, if you're an agent, you don't have no money. You say, I got a lot of investment. I want to buy. You want to sell it. So you can double end it, right? If it's a listing, just go for the listing. Low inventory, you want to sell it. If they're not home, leave a flyer, but make a note on your flyer, listing, badass fixer. So when you cold call them at, when you go back to the office and find the number, you cold call, you know exactly, are you calling as a fixer or are you calling for a listing? And that's what I would do two or three hours a day, five days a week if I was a new agent. Love it. That's some really good advice right there. Um, can you talk about, you also, um, is it called Springboard? Because yep. I was on the website looking at it. It looks really cool. Can you kind of give me a, a quick overview of what Springboard is? So basically Springboard is uh, I partnered with my two partners, Mark and Stephanie. And basically it's teaching agent how to go find property where you can sell to investor and builder. So right now investor and builder are all buying. If the price is right, they're still buying. So in a reclined market, investor and builder are still buying if the price is right. So we teach agent, especially agent, how to go out there and identify off-market property that investor want to buy, flip, or builder want to buy to build houses. When you find these property, we also teach you how to build a list for the investor and list for the builder. So when you find it, you would double end it to them and double end the front end commission. And then you ask for all the list back when they get done with it. So like what I do is if I don't like a property, I will sell it to a builder and I get double in the front end. But when he get done, Build new construction, these townhouses, four, five, six, eight new townhouses, I'll get all the list backs on those as my listing. And that's another way how Omar, I'm getting list backs and making money on that. So basically, that's what we teach. Teach the agent how to find off market property where you can sell them to builders and investors. I mean, I think that's such a good model because because a lot of times, um, you know, if you're a good agent and you're working with flippers, you're making just as money, much money on the buy side and the sell side as the flipper made, right? And that's just the reality of it is and, and then you can also cherry pick the deals that you personally want to do. Right. So it's a it's a it's a great it's a great model. I love it. Um, somebody just asked another question. Uh, uh, here. They're asking, um, how are how are you identifying the fixture list? I mean, it's pretty simple. You can I mean, one is you can go on the MLS and look at all fixtures there. And, and, and then you could also pull lists from uh, the city a code violation list. Um, you know, when you're walking around, you're going to see houses. You just take the address and pull a property profile. You can pull a notice of default list. I mean, usually notice the fault or just are distressed. What else, what other ways do you guys identify? What I do is in my area. Okay. I'm gonna give you guys a million dollar tip. Okay. In my area, I use the tax record. Okay. This is a fixer up for house right here in Seattle. Okay. This is what I'm working on right now. Okay. And if you ever look at any property, they have a King County assessed value. 
Okay. And this one is assessed at $710,000 total land and structure. Does that make sense? Yep. The structure value, Ty, do you have the calculator rating in hand? They said the structure, the land is assessed from the city for 500,000 and the, the structure is assessed for 210,000. What percentage of the structure of the total value, Ty and Bo, you got a calculator in front of you? Bo's doing it right now. 42%, is that right? right. Yeah. Right, so actually less than that, 210 divided by 710 is what? That's like uh, what? Uh, oh, 710, sorry. 710. So 210 divided by 710. Probably 30%, right? Yeah, 29%. 29%. What I know in Seattle, you got ready for this? Here's the million dollar thing. I can go to the county record, Bo and Ty, and I can punch in. I want all the property in this zip code I'm working. I want all the structure value to be 40% to 0%. And I know that's a fixer in my neighborhood. So I tell them that I have the, the title company send me all those property in that zip code with all the structure value that is 40% less of the total value in that zip code. And when I get that list, every one of those property are zero to 40% of the total value. So now I got a whole entire list of fixer upper. Now I can go drive a dollar, but I'm driving a dollar with a purpose now versus just randomly. Love it. You find fixer upper. I, I think a lot of people, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm in this guilty party too, and you guys coach people. A lot of people are always so concerned about where to get the list and stuff. But the bottom line is, is that's so easy to do. You're, easy. Just, you're just setting roadblocks so you don't go out and door knock, right? That's what they're doing. I, I do it myself. Yeah. It's called call reluctance. Yeah. <laughs> right? But I just gave you guys a million dollar tip on how to find fixer in your whole entire city. Any city, every city has a King County record. Love it. Love it. Regis, Regis just asked, who's the best hard money lender? Well, uh, I'm going to just say that's me. You can you can call me at 925-852-8261. Uh, let me know what, what state you're in. I can lend in almost every state. Um, I prefer to do, you know, loans 250000 and higher. Um, smaller loans I can still do. Just let me know. If I can't do it, I'm going to refer it to the right person. Do you do all California, Bo? I, yeah, I'll do every state pretty much. Every state. There's only a, four states I don't do right now, but pr primarily my best, the easiest states to lend in are Washington and California. I have the most amount of money there. Well, make sure I get your contact, bro. I got a lot of people that follow me in California that always need hard money lending, okay? Yeah, I will. And I also wanted to point out that when you're doing these bigger um, apartment deals, you should look, I, I, I'm affiliated with a direct lender for HUD. Yep. So you should be 35 year uh, amortized loans the first two years, um, you don't have to make payments. And then uh, the rates right now are about 2.9 to 3%. Yes. And it's 35, right? So 20, 20 years from now, if you want to sell it, th those loans are assumable or 15 years. And yeah. if you got 3% money, that thing's going to be, that's a huge selling proposition. So yeah, but thank you. I'm going to definitely give you my contact information as well. I've been, it's funny before Ty said you were coming on the show, I've been following you on YouTube for a long time. So it was just like, oh man, Ty, you're delivering people I actually like and I watch their content <laughs> and it's super solid. Um, the other thing is, is when the coronavirus is down, I would love to invite you and Ty for some pool parties here in Las Vegas. I'm down, baby. Okay. I'm and, down. and a mastermind. And and the other thing is too, is- um, I'm going to say we're fun, bro. <laughs> we do a fun one day- uh, 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 real estate seminar in Las Vegas. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There you go. And hey. then I'm gonna I'm gonna take you to my favorite Vietnamese restaurant in town. Okay. I I eat a ton of Vietnamese food. I love it. It's my favorite food. That and sushi. Yeah. That's it. Yes. Yes. Let Let me bring it around. So I'm just looking at the um it, with regard to like closing thoughts. Thatch. I mean, yeah. we got 60, 70 people on here. Obviously, the replay is gonna go out. Um. You know, half of half of them are just pure investors. Some of them have other jobs. And then we have a lot of realtors on here, too, yeah. that are aspiring to make transitions. And again, man, thank you so much for being here. Um, you're, you're a true inspiration to myself, as well as everybody who's watching. And um, again, I just appreciate your contribution and sharing. Is there any kind of 
thoughts, things that just like things that you want to really hammer home with this group. Yeah. So I'm going to say to you guys this, okay. The biggest takeaway I want to tell you guys over and over and over is Warren Buffett said it well too. If you don't find a way to make money when you're asleep, you're going to work until you die. Mm. Right. If you don't find a way to make money when you're asleep, you're going to work till you die. Listen, I am a big advocate of real estate agent selling and making a lot of money. But if you're selling to make a lot of money and you don't have the mindset of actually trading your uh, creating wealth for tomorrow, so you can one day stop the, the running on the treadmill, then you're also not being very smart. I'm a big, big advocate for a guy who's up flipping houses. But if you're flipping houses to flip houses and never actually pull any money off so you can actually own rental, you're going to work until you die. Same way with wholesaler. So all of us, wholesaler, builder, realtor, loan officer, we all work in this vehicle purely to bring in cash flow to the front door so we can reinvest it and do burr model like this and keep it a cash flow property for the future. So when bad time come, when the virus come, 9-11 come, you guys, the problem when 9-11 come, when the market crashed, when this happened, everybody who has a cash flow problem, a, a, a business, right now the biggest problem everybody in America have right now is called cash flow. Because they got no work. They got no work, got no cash flow. But if you got rental property, you're gonna make money. Now, unfortunately, in this scenario, we got a financial issue and a health issue. You know what I mean? We didn't really have a financial issue. We had a health issue in this in this economy, right? Right now. Yeah. But in the future, when property you know slowing down, 99% of the rent is still paid. Few of them are gonna leave and you just rebook them again. Yeah. But the point I'm making is most people when the market goes down, they stop running real estate business, wholesaling. And that's the problem where they stop, go, stop, go. The part of the time you stop, go and stop. Then you got to go back and take you two, three, four, five years to get back to your par. So by 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, you really didn't get that far. And what's the difference between what I did was I just kept plucking away because I, I was only making about 900 to a million bucks a year in income, but I was plugging away and just parking money, parking money, parking money. And then 20 years, 30 years down today, I look back and go, God damn, I can't believe I own all these property and got a lot of them paid off. So the key, folks, is whatever you do for a living, I don't care if you're a janitor, a truck driver, use your vehicle to make a lot of cash. What I love about the Asian people, you guys, is they have a nail shop, haircut, pho, pho one, pho two, pho three, right? They own money shop, right? And they make money the hard way, hard way. But you know what they do? They take all the money they make and they buy a lot of real estate. That's why you see a lot of minority own a lot of real estate. And a lot of them are super rich. And they still have the Bundy shop just because they own Bundy shop, but they own a lot of real estate. So yeah. whatever be good you do to make cash flow, just be smart and go find good investment property and park it. So 20 years from now, you have the option to work when you want to work, where you want to work. And if anything ever happened, you ain't going to be dictated by the market. You still are running your life good. Love it, man. Love it. So tell people, that's awesome, dude. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being on here. How can people reach you? Tell them like, tell them the Springboard website, how they can find you, learn more about that. And then also share your Instagram handle or how you want people to connect and follow you. Uh, if you got one to know about Springboard, you go to Springboard to Wealth. Two is T-O. Springboard to Wealth.com. Check them out. Okay. That's the company where we teach you how to do that. And then you guys follow me on Instagram and um, and the Facebook. Just my name, that's Win. And I drop a lot of stuff on Instagram every single day. I drop a lot of tips, a lot of information every single day over there. So go there, check it out. And um, every in the month of April, every week, I'm going to be interviewing two live people every single week who are entrepreneur some way somehow. And I'm going to share with you guys what they're doing to inspire more people also to keep doing what Ty doing. I'm going to interview people on Instagram every week, two people. And uh, tomorrow I'm interviewing Dan and Navarro, but yes. you guys go on Instagram. You got to see all the different people I'm going to uh, interview in the month of April. And I got a lot more coming. What time do you do your interviews? Say the day and time. What is it a recurring uh, Monday, day? Friday at 12 o'clock PST. Yep. And 30 okay. minutes long. That's it. 
And you're doing it live on Instagram and as well as Facebook Live? Uh, no, just Instagram Live only. Just Instagram Live. Okay, yeah, guys. Yeah, so there yeah. you have it. So there you guys have it. Get with Thatch. Check out his stuff. Thank you, Thatch, for sharing with the group. Man, this has been a great, great interview, dude. And, uh, man, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you and your contributions to myself personally as well as everybody we know and how you inspire. Bo, do you want to sign us out? Yeah, I mean, this was an awesome event. I mean, people were very excited. People said they'd love the, they love our energy and – and, and I think it's, you know, you're, you're bringing my energy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so amped up right now. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go make money and then I'm going to go buy real estate That's and, it, baby. and I'm going to, I'm going to cold call and door knock. It's really not that hard. You just got to be driven there. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, I'm really serious about this mastermind in Vegas because people were talking to, they said we have to do a pool party though. It has to, we have to have a, a part of it that we go to a pool and, you know, have a we couple do Saturday. Days. We'll do Saturday the event. Saturday night we'll party, and then Sunday we'll go to a pool party, and we'll 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 make it like a two day thing. So the Sunday will be the pool party. We'll go out for good dinner <laughs> on Saturday night. Yeah, we'll definitely light it up. We'll go to Vegas as soon as this thing calms down. All right, all right. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. For show notes and useful resources, please visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com. For questions or comments, email info at InvestorFinancingPodcast.com. If you enjoy our show, please share it with your network. Until next time.